Welcome to the Tuscarawas County Anti-Drug Coalition podcast, bringing you open and honest conversations about resources in Tuscarawas County. Now here's your host, Jody Salvo. Hi, this is Jody Salvo with the Tuscarawas County Anti-Drug Coalition podcast. Today we have two wonderful guests from the New Philly, uh, New Philadelphia City Health Department. We have Vicki Iona, the director of the health, the health commissioner. Let me get that correct. I am so sorry, Vicki. Bye. And Nicole Bates. Um, you know what? I am horrible with names and titles. So let me say, would you mind introducing yourself, Nick, <laughs> Vicki? Sure. I'm Vicki Iono. I'm the health commissioner at New Philadelphia City Health Department. Wonderful. And I'm Nicole Bates. I'm the director of nursing at New Philadelphia City Health Department. Perfect. You know what? You guys are such a vital piece of the whole pandemic, our health departments. And clearly, um, I think, is a city, is a county, is a nation. I mean, clearly, we're all struggling with how do you deal with a pandemic and everything that comes out of that, um, from fear to anxiety to physical health to loss of jobs and stress that has come upon us all and families and communities. Um, so I know you guys have a lot of weight on your shoulder. Um, and it actually was Mayor Day that said, Hey, give those guys a call, um, because they're doing great work. Um, and if anyone has seen in the paper, there've definitely been some need, um, out of New Philadelphia in particular on the substance use issue. And clearly we're able to connect the dots enough to know, okay, there's a perfect storm that's happening in our world right now. It's impacting some local communities. Um, so we're really glad to have you guys here today just to have, kind of have a conversation. What does a health department do? What's a health department doing in the midst of just really um, crazy times, unprecedented times? Um, so let's just start. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the health department? Okay, so our city health department has been uh, uh, there and established since 1854. So it's very, very old, very long term. And uh, we're very proud of our, our city health department. We In Tuscarawas County, we have two health departments, um, the county health department um, and then the New Philadelphia city. Some counties have like four. They're, yeah. they're Star County, for one, they have four health departments. So we do a whole variety of things, but it's all about prevention and, um, and, tr- and trying to help people with disease and prevention of disease and um, monitoring for health statuses. Go ahead and let people know some of the work of the health department, because I think it's it's probably more encompassing than people know. I know when I've been on the website, you're like, oh, my goodness, and they do this and this and mosquito control and everything else. So. <laughs> yep. So though there's a, a few divisions. We have vital s- statistics, which is uh, where we issue death certificates for anyone who passed in the city of New Philadelphia and also birth certificates for anyone who was born in Ohio since 1908. Yeah. Uh, so they can get their birth certificate from us. Um, we also have a clinic where we do immunizations, we do blood pressure checks, we do HIV free free HIV say, that- free HIV testing, uh, free blood pressure checks, uh, free A one C testing, um, and all that's uh, to be given the credit for the the grants and people's uh, generous donations. So that's what us. I was going to ask. You're funded by. We'll find, well, we're funded uh, in part by our city council. Okay. Yeah, they, they make up any funding gaps that we have. Nice. So that way we can offer affordable, very affordable services. Uh, vaccines for kids are $15 uh, for the first one, $10 for an additional one in the same visit. Uh, adult vaccines are $20. Flu shots are 25 You know, it's very, very affordable. Um, we're proud to say that we are open always to uh, helping where we can and making it as, as affordable for people who have barriers. Nice. So if someone would want to access the health department, what would they do? Nicole? Right. They could just call our office. Uh, we allow adults to walk in for services. It's a good idea to call ahead just to see if we're going to have a busy schedule. They might wait a, a few minutes. Um, and for children, we have an immunization nurse that we prefer that um, does our immunizations. She's the guru. She knows the schedules. She's good at what she does. So um, and then besides uh, clinical, we also have environmental health. Okay. Environmental health then is a whole host of things as well. They do inspections of restaurants and, and food, uh, retail food. 
Um, they also do the mosquito spraying for our city and surrounding I like that benefit sur- surrounding <laughs> areas like Goshen. We have contract with them to because our borders uh, uh, come together, and uh, they do a lot of uh, follow ups on complaints, animal bites, rabies investigation, all those things. So I know we're going to talk about COVID a little bit, but are they involved with enforcement of masks and? Yeah, Restaurants um, so and- as if anybody's watching the governor, you know, he has written a lot of directives, a lot of uh, orders that that involve the health departments. The local health departments are the, um, the ones that it needs to enforce uh, some of these directives, um, masking being one, social distancing. So um, I'm assuming y'all are getting a lot of calls about stuff like that. Yeah, we have a lot of calls. Our phone, it consumes us some days, you know. Okay, for listeners, I'm just going to throw this out here. I get to see um, Nicole and Vicki at meetings. And I did, my first question, like, how's it going? Like, I understand you guys might be getting a lot of call. And they're like, yeah, not all of it's positive. Um, I really just want to say people do not work in jobs like public health if they do not care about communities in person. So I only throw out, you know, are you getting calls on the mass? Because I mean, you can't not be on social media and kind of yeah. feel, you know, the controversy yeah. on those issues, but you guys are doing your job and the mandates that are placed right. upon you. Too. Right. And, I mean, wearing the mask is not a, a anything we, any of us wanted, yeah. bit, but none of us wanted a global pandemic, you know? So we basically, I keep saying, have these three tools in our tool chest uh, okay. for COVID. And that is wearing our facial coverings, um, social distancing, uh-huh. and then hand washing okay, or sanitizing. And that is it. That is, that is it. <laughs> so we have to do our best to slow the spread. We're not going to stop the spread, but we're trying to keep it to where it's manageable, where the hospitals can keep up. And someone asked me the other day in a, in a presentation I was doing now, why are we so concerned when the whole county has only had 700 and at that moment, 49 cases a couple of days ago, uh, and we got 72 or 92,000 population. And I'm like, we had five people die in our city from this COVID. I mean, every person counts. Yeah. Absolutely. That's why we're if it's your family it. member, you yeah, get it. That's why we're doing it. And in the entire county, we've lost 14 people from, from this, was diagnosed with COVID and passed. And I think also for people to understand, not that we want to lose anybody, but these aren't necessarily our feral elderly either that no. we're losing. You know? No, actually only one of ours was over 80. Um, we've had a couple in the 50s, one in the 40s, one in the 60s. So, you know... Uh, it's just that it's it's a horrible thing to watch and, yeah. and, and work with families who's lost their loved one because of COVID. Um, some have comorbidities. You know, you can argue, did you die with it or from it? But yeah. we, we just know that they were positive and they passed. And maybe they wouldn't have passed that day. Yeah. You know, so we just don't know. There's a lot to know about this virus. Yeah. Well, I know... Uh, one of the persons on a ventilator is my age, you know, and then it, it really does hit home very quickly, you know, when people are going like, you know, why if this is the number and you're thinking, if this is yourself, your spouse, you know, a loved one, as soon as you kind of get a face on what the impact of COVID really can be. Yeah. And it's, it's a hard thing to understand because we just talked about this you can be asymptomatic as well, you know? So it, it's a hard thing to kind of wrap your head around. Uh, absolutely. Good. So thank you for sharing. Nicole, what kind of work do you do at the health department? Um, well, as the director of nursing, I also head up the communicable disease department. So I'm the one that's dealing with all the positive cases coming in. Um, most of the contact tracing, entering them into the um, Ohio disease reporting system, trying to trace back and see who have you been in contact with? Who needs to be quarantined? Who needs to be isolated? Figuring it all out, um, as well as any other communicable disease. Um, we're, we're constantly doing that, but the COVID and pandemic has pushed that into the forefront of this is what your health sure. department does for you. We've always been in the background monitoring diseases and 
um, tracing and trying to figure out where they are in our community, but it's very important at this time. Um, also, as well, I, I help run the medication-assisted treatment program nice. at the clinic, so I know we'll be discussing that a little bit yeah, for absolutely. addiction. Neat. Well, you know what? With that, let's go ahead and switch the gears a little bit. Um, one of the reasons that I called y'all to have you here um, on this podcast is because I know you guys do great work in New Philadelphia, um, but we also know in a county around substance use, we have really had some crazy um, incidents of use and overdose in the last six months. So I'm just going to read the number. Um, and I read this on another podcast, but it still takes my breath away. Um, we had a 283% increase in overdose deaths in the first six months of 2020. Okay, so we're talking the pandemic. Um we are well on track to exceed the number of overdose deaths than we did at the height of the opioid, opioid epidemic. And I spoke with your mayor as well, and he's done a great job to just to put a call to action this past week or last week on this particular issue. Because of the, I think as of today, we probably have 18 deaths in a county in the last six months. Um, 10 of those are from the city of New Philadelphia. So we have an opiate task force that you both sit on here in the county, and we kind of monitor overdose, drug use, um, as it it is, affects Tuscarawas County. And we we have a great, uh, we have Wes Halder from the New Philly Fire Department, who is our data guru, and he works with the health department's the coroner's office to really kind of track um, what's going on, where those overdoses are, is working with the sheriff's department, the police department's to kind of keep an eye on this. But from time to time, we identify hot spots. And clearly it looks like it's the city of New Philadelphia right now. So I love that the mayor is like, look, this is a public health crisis. Um, so I want to talk about that a little bit. You mentioned um, the medicated assisted program or Viv the Vivitrol program. So tell me a little bit about some of the work y'all are doing here. Let me talk to that, Vicki. Um, so... We do offer Vivitrol treatment at our facility. Tell people, of it. I'm like yes. the queen. I just love Vivitrol. Vivitrol is so. amazing. Um, if you talk to someone who's been in the throes of addiction and they're on Vivitrol, they just can't say enough about it. Um, it is a once a month injection that they receive and it blocks the, the receptor sites in the brain um, to where they don't have the cravings and they don't have the want or... Um, they really even couldn't get high if they tried to use a drug at that point in time while they're on the Vivitrol. And it gives them time for their brain to have a break and be able to get their life in order and go to counseling and do the things that they need to do and straighten themselves out. And it's really um, been successful with helping people to get on Game the right changer, path. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. Now, you guys have been doing Vivitrol for quite some time now, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 2015. 2015, like you were the first ones where first we- First ones could, in the county that uh, started uh, offering to Vivitrol to clients with opiate addiction. Yes. We have to be clear that it doesn't help with every drug uh, addiction or dependence, but it does uh, do a great job for opiates. Okay. Um, I'm glad you bring that up. And those statistics, um, we're seeing the overdose deaths on two things. We're seeing on the synthetic opioids, which does work for the Vivitrol, correct? Yes. And then we're seeing methamphetamines. Those are kind of where we're seeing the deaths in our county. Um, so the Vivitrol program is going to be effective for our opioid or synthetic opioid, correct? Yes. So what would someone need to know if they have a loved one that's struggling with prescription drug um, addiction or heroin, whatever, fentanyl, what well, can they do? You know, they can call our office anytime. I field calls from family members, um, people that are actually in addiction themselves, just looking to get out. And I'm willing to talk it over and talk over the steps of getting you into the treatment program. But um, there really has to be buy-in from the person that's going to be receiving the injection. They can't okay. just be doing it because mom really wants me to take the shot and get sober. Um, in that case, I think we're just buying them time. We're not sure. 
you know, they have to buy in and go to counseling and do what they need to do to actually heal their mind and get better. Now, can you take Vivitrol when you're still using an opioid? No, absolutely not. They need to be um, sober for seven days before we inject the first dose. Now, that's a challenge for a lot of people. So what what do we let people know if they're still using, they heard wonderful things about Vivitrol? Um, You know, most of the time, by the time they get to me, they're really committed and they're looking to get um, sober and get the help. And a lot of them have been able to get to that seven days. Um, If they can get to five and they call me and say, I just don't know that I'm going to make it to the full seven, we'll definitely consider um, the risk versus outcome there. And we have possibly injected maybe a day or two before that seven days. Now, you know what? What happens if you inject early? They can get really, really sick, that, okay. that dope sick feeling, because it's So if someone's not honest with you. Right. And, Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, they, they've said they feel like death, basically, yeah. Okay. Now, referrals to your program, are they coming from the jail, recovery court? Where do they, agencies? Um, you know, a little bit of, of, uh, of all of that. Okay. We, we do get some referrals from the jail or recovery court. Um, several of our clients right now are coming from Wellmore Center, um, one of the counseling centers in the area. Um, and some of them, I had someone last week that just called in and wanted to get information and get on the um, Vivitrol program. So uh, at that point, I would refer them to counseling as well because we won't take them without counseling. Nice. I, I only say nice because yeah. Vivitrol is a tool to help someone really to really recover, to get to recovery. So it's really nice because when I've heard people in recovery that are using other uh, medicated assisted treatment programs, they still are battling the dreams, the cravings, um, some of those things that come along with addiction. So it's really hard. You hear them struggling more in in that treatment phase because they're still not right. And that's the wonderful thing with Vivitrol, you know, it stops those cravings and it stops those using dreams. Nobody has them anymore that, that at least that's gone through our program. I don't know that anybody's told you Vicki that they have, but everybody says, you know, it's gone. Yeah. So they're able to actually think clearly at that point. So we probably need to have y'all bring someone that's been through the Vivitrol program or even on it sometime And help people understand uh, why we're singing the praises of Vivitrol. Um, Yeah, because, you know, it just, it just blocks their cravings. All of a sudden they can think straight. They can do what they're supposed to do. They can learn the new behaviors. Um, We just, we we can't say enough good things about it. We've had very, very little uh, side effects. I mean, it's just a pretty effective way to help people at least. Um, pull it together. Uh, you know, often we, Nicole and I'll say, um, uh, sometimes when we first meet our clients that they're coming out of uh, detox and stuff and their, their life's quite a mess, you know, and as we, as they get cleaner and pull their self back together and start to see their children again and, and pulling their lives together and building trust with the loved ones that they had broken, you know, um, we say, you know, they become very likable for us. We get very attached, you know, very attached to them. And we just do everything we can to help them, you know, finish it. And, and, and so it, it's rewarding to see someone come through on the other side. So how many patients have you seen since uh, oh, clients gosh. have you seen? That's, that's hard to determine um, over the last five years. I, I w- it's in the hundreds, you know, it's in the Lovely. hundreds. But uh, I can't, you know, without my my spreadsheets, I, I can't say offhand. And you're giving the shot every right. month. So I do, you're... and um, we have another nurse, Vicki as well, can give the shots. If need be. Okay. But, um, I think something else to note with it is Medicaid pays 100% for Vivitrol. So nice. it's not, if they're on Medicaid because they aren't working maybe um, while they're working to get their life back together, it's 100% paid for. Most private insurances will cover it, and there is... Um, a prescription assistance plan through Vivitrol, which I've successfully helped some people on private insurance that have jobs get on and have very little copay. So it makes it very affordable because it is an expensive drug. Yeah. Now, how long is someone on Vivitrol? Um, we recommend two years, 24 okay. months. Um, if you want to see long-term success, you've got to work stay the program treatment. and you got to stay in treatment. 
Neat. So all kinds of wonderful things about that. Talk to us about naloxone because that's an overdose reversal drug and you all have been administ- uh, dispensing that for quite some time as right. well, correct? So uh, a couple of years ago, I wrote for a grant for uh, a, a, a reversal drug called uh, FZO. FZO. Okay. And FZO granted us 200 uh, kits um, of, of the drug to offer up for people who maybe aren't there yet, but they are at risk of overdose. Uh, each packet can, comes with two, uh, two milligram doses uh, that's injected and you inject it right through the clothing, like on a thigh, you know. You have the one that speaks to you, right? Yeah, I've seen you. Comes with um, a trainer, you know, and the trainer tell, talks you through how to do it. And um, it, it's really simple. Um, and anything we can get anything we can get into the hands of someone who might potentially overdose and, and die, uh, we want to do. So we have plenty of those still on hand and we nice. want to make sure everyone knows that they can come call us up, stop by, whatever, we'll, we'll give them to you. So let's kind of even break this down further. Who should be contacting you all to get the EBSEO? Anybody. Anybody. Anybody can call. It doesn't have to be a resident of New Philadelphia. To our service, none of it is jurisdictional except our environmental health. Uh, we stay within our city to spray mosquitoes and, and do restaurant inspections and stuff. Nice. But um, the clinical, uh, you know, anyone is welcome. And I think it's important for family, you know, if you have someone that's at risk or if you have friends that are at risk or even if you're using yourself um, to have this this medication in your purse or in your home so that it can be used in the time. You never know when you're going to need yeah. it. So um, to think I can wait and go to the health department and grab it when I need it. That's minutes wasted and lives lost. Um, but the really neat thing about this Evzio is it talks you through. So I know um, as a nurse, that when something happens to my kids, I'm oh, in yeah. panic mode anyway. I can't even imagine having no health care and walking in and seeing your child in that position where they're overdosed. Evzio talks you right through doing it. Um, it you take the lid off and it tells you to inject, where to inject, it counts down how long to hold it there, when to pull it off the leg. It walks you completely through it. So it's, it's really foolproof. Now, as we're having this conversation, one thing I'm realizing to the listeners, this is a very normal conversation that us three would have at the table. And I'm looking at Josh as he's taping us and it might not be a completely normal conversation for you. Um, but it seems normal to us because we've been talking about overdose reversal drugs forever. We've been talking about Vivitrol and how do we get people from addiction to treatment, what tools and resources we have. And clearly we have them at the New Philly, New Philadelphia Health Department. We have them throughout our uh, treatment agencies um, here in the county. But this wasn't a normal conversation even probably three or four years ago. Oh, when we are yeah. public health, we're uh-huh. not counselors. We're not, you know, we're not in the addictive addiction world or the uh, uh, dependence world. But we realized back in 15 that this was a public health crisis and that we wanted to be part of it. And Nicole and I went up to, to the Oriana house up in, um, in Akron to visit them because they had started giving Vivitrol. We were on the fence of whether we wanted to do it or not and we'll get involved or not. And and after we went there, we spoke to three young men that were on it um, at the Oriana House and they're, they're, they had great eye contact. They were talking clear. Um, they said without this Vivitrol, we probably would, would not be here. Uh, one, one guy had been 15 years in, in addiction and um, thinks now, he said, I, now I feel like I can leave here and go and, and resume a normal life and stay out of use. And so we drove away from there saying that we have to be part of this. So this, that's why we got involved. I appreciate that. On the podcast here, often we're talking about addiction. Um, and I just think it's so important for us to know, even three, four, five years ago in our county, People were very conflicted about how we handle people struggling with addiction. Even when we first started talking about overdose um, reversal medication, people weren't understanding why are we continuing to um, bring people back that continue to overdose. And I think it's just important for people to understand when 
no one, no one ever wants to be addicted to a substance and no one sets out to become addicted to a substance. And the way people come into addiction is different. Uh, It is so different. It can be from, I had a work injury. I was prescribed a prescription medication and I became addicted. No fault of their own. It just happened. Um, It could be a young person's curiosity. Fell in addiction. I think some of my saddest stories that I've heard are are generational families um, that actually gave their kids drugs for the first time. And you hear that. And and I've heard that. And it's heartbreaking as a parent myself just to think, you know, at 12, 10, 8 years old, some of them, they're saying mom and dad gave me pills because they didn't want to deal with me. And, you know, I, I just, how do you break that cycle? Yeah. That's normal life to them. So for our listeners, to understand addiction can happen to absolutely anybody. I'm sure through your program, you've seen yeah. every kind of person. Yep. Doesn't it, matter what family, what socioeconomic. And what, if it hasn't touched you or your family, it's easy to be judgmental and, and say, well, it was their choice. I've heard that, you know, but it, in some cases it wasn't their choice. And, you know, our, our medical director says it this way. He said, each of us is made up with a um, genetic makeup that says, you might take a drink and say, that was okay. I might take a drink and say, oh, I just saw this, God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, that lit up my brain to the point that I had to have more. And so, you know, there's a lot to understand about addiction. Well, I appreciate that conversation because it can happen to anyone, but I need, I I really want our listeners to understand that we have some tools. Um, We need to keep people alive. We need to have the FZO for people that might overdose because the only way we're going to get them healthy is through treatment and um, we need to keep them alive so we can offer, um, future and, chances and you know they may not be ready for treatment today so we save them with that fzo and maybe tomorrow's the day where they wake up and say i'm ready for treatment yeah. so you know it's really it plays an important role and everyone that's struggling with addiction is somebody somebody you know mm-hmm. it's somebody's child it's somebody's wife or husband or father you know so i think sometimes it's important just to have a face or understanding that that addiction is not the person. There is a person there that is struggling with an addiction and treatment is effective. Recovery is absolutely possible. And we do need tools like the Vivitrol or the overdose um, reversal drugs. um, So we can get people into treatment and into recovery. Just like we spoke of with COVID, who can we dispense of? Who's not valuable to us? It's the same thing. We don't want to see people's life lost to infected by COVID. We don't want to see them lost because they have this dependence on on, on a drug. Um, They're all valuable in society. My job as the health commissioner is to protect the health and safety of my residents. and That's what we take seriously. Nice. So we've definitely seen in the city of New Philadelphia increase of substance use, overdoses, mental health crises, attempts on suicide. What can we do as community members? What would you say to your residents of New Philadelphia? You need to reach out to people. I think right now is the best time. Vicki and I have said to multiple people, now's the time to be a good human. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> reach out. I know we're wanting to keep six foot distance and we're wanting to so, so isolate and um, we're worried about spreading COVID, but that isolation and separation is having rippling effects throughout our community. It's, it's really tearing down the um, social supports that the people in addiction had prior sure. to this happening. And um whether it's somebody in addiction or an elderly neighbor that's worried about going out and getting COVID or reach out to people, 
They need that right you now. You can do it safely. Yeah. You know, you can do it via phone. You, you so if stand. the health commissioner is telling us how to reach out, let's listen. <laughs> Vicki, how can we le- reach out safely? So here? I want to say, say social distancing. We're just talking six feet. So stand back from the porch, you know, stand back, drop something off on their porch and say, here's a, here's a, a, a coffee cake I baked or a, a, a meal I made extra or, you know, call them up. Just call them up and say, how are you over there? And, and are you guys okay doing and do you need anything? Also the same thing with our folks who are struggling with addiction, you know, with, they just, they want to get better. They yeah. don't like themselves. And mo- that's what we found out when we work with them. They, they're, they detest themselves for what they, the drug has caused them to do. And I'm not trying to make it light and not no. their responsibility, but, but you know, when you're craving and you're so sick, it's the worst flu you've ever, ever had. And you don't feel better until you get the next, you know, hit of a drug, then, you know, they'll do things that they normally wouldn't do. Sure. So we, we want to have some compassion for that. And, and we know we're not the counselors. That's not our lane. We're going to stay in our own lane, but we can sure help with supporting people through the medication assisted treatment and then making sure they're referred to great, the great counseling agencies we have available to us here in our, right. in our county. You know, the other day I had a conversation with someone in our county who um, runs a community center and clearly there's all kinds of barriers to how do we run a community center in the middle of a pandemic. So she was just saying, what can we do? And, and it was kind of very similar to what you were saying, Nicole, I think we're at a very grassroots level of how we need to take care of uh, each other, you know, and it might not be that traditional meeting people at groups and social situations and, and things that we had in place before. But I do think your ministry, your your area of influence is seriously right when you walk out the door. You know, be mindful of which houses are beside you, across the street from you. And I think we need to be just intentional in those relationships. Because you're right, we can't say social distance as we're standing in our driveway and having a conversation. And I think that's important because um, humans are clearly meant to have social interaction mm-hmm. and connection. And I think that's where we're seeing our increased overdoses. We're seeing our increased suicide attempts um, because that isolation, especially if you're in addiction, can cause a lot of demons to rear up because you probably have a little too much time to think and you're probably missing that normal accountability you have on a daily basis. I mean, absolutely. Right now, our world is flipped upside down. I don't care who you are. Yep. And it's hard for even people who don't struggle with addiction, you know, myself included, is to really deal with the day-to-day inconveniences mm-hmm. that we are now experiencing. <clears throat> we get to look at it both ways. We can either feel sorry for ourselves and just be angry about the whole thing, or we can just accept what we can do and accept what is possible right now, what we're still able to do. We can still go pick up our carry out food or eat in in some places. We could still do things that that is safe and, mm-hmm. and, and what I call dance around this virus, yeah. you know. So there's a lot of things that we're still able to do, but it's ha- happened to make a lot of people re- hit the reset button. You know, they didn't spend a lot of time with their kids. Sure. They didn't play board games anymore. You know, they didn't stay at home much. Um, they wanted the world to entertain them. And so COVID has caused us to say, whoa, you know, let's get back to the basics. What do we absolutely yeah. need to, to get along in our life? And what can we make out of it? You know, what can we take advantage of? I agree. There's going to be some beautiful thing. It's hard to see the beauty sometimes in the midst of a storm. But my goodness, I think that reconnection or, you know, reprioritizing life or, you know, not just going all the time. I, ho- I hope we do take some things out of here. I know as a family, we eat dinner together every single night. I think we have since March, you know, it's kind of delightful. Yeah, so. it's different for sure. It's hard to accept. Sometimes you can't wrap your head around all the changes and you want to blame somebody or something, but it's to no one's fault. This COVID is just a pandemic that none of us expected. Sure. None of us had ever lived through. And if we make mistakes along the way, 
of trying to adjust as things make us adjust. Yeah. You know, it's just what we need to do. We're forging new trails here. Well, I think as for the health department, um, it's like riding a bicycle as you're building it because you guys get new information every single day. Um, so it's not even that it's misinformation, it's just new information. And then we have to integrate it in what we have. The data is changing us. on a daily basis. New studies are coming out every day. So it's important to keep up on that and reading it and know what's going on because people are looking to our office to give answers. And sometimes we just don't have them or I'll tell someone something and hours later something new comes out and I, I'm sitting there feeling awful because I am like, I feel like I just completely misinformed them, but we're sharing what we know when we know it yep. and no fault of our own or anybody else's things are just changing so rapidly. Well, this is a definite shout out to the residents of New Philadelphia. You have a mayor, you have a city council, you have a health department that really wants the best for your city. And are there challenges now? Absolutely. They're everywhere. Um, are we seeing, you know, some statistics that are kind of taking our breath away? We are, but we definitely have agencies, we have departments, we have resources. Um, we need to reach out for help if we need it. We need to be mindful of our neighbors and those that are in our lives to share the resources or, you know, to maybe even help I, people identify if they're kind of getting into a funk. Because I think sometimes anxiety and depression can kind of sneak up on you. And it's easy for those to sneak up on you in the middle of this crazy world. So if you see someone and maybe they're not quite acting the way they normally are to kind of say, hey, you know, we have these services or resources. Or if we have people fearful about the pandemic, they can give you all a call, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll help wherever we can. You know, even the virus itself, uh, post-virus, some people have still have mental fog for a while. They have depression from it for a while. I mean, it affects so many different systems. And not everyone gets it the same. Uh, but we forget about the brain is also affected during the COVID infection. And um, whether you had a, a severe symptoms or not, sometimes it's the minor things like just just can't think straight. And so crazy. So it's a crazy world right now. But, you know, for as far as recovery there, you know, our counselors are getting back up in person. Our groups are getting back. Our courts are back open. So there's there's things will come back. You know, we, we identified a real problem and we're going to work real hard to see what we can Perfect. change, change its course. I know you were giving shout outs to New Philadelphia, but I have to say our county as a whole, the way we come together and Absolutely. have this opiate task force, other counties don't have this. I, I know our county. <laughs> <laughs> a few years ago, I was asked to come and present to the state nursing um directors down in Columbus and I was giving a presentation on Vivitrol and how we got it up and running and I was talking about our opiate task force and so many questions were how did you get everybody to the table how do you get yeah. them all to sit down and work and tackle this problem together and I'm like we just it do just, yeah, yeah we just all came and sat down we didn't have that problem but most counties don't have that so we definitely have great leadership with the Adams board and pulling this all together great I have the pleasure that I um I'm the president of the statewide coalition association. And often I'll talk about what we're doing in the county. And I get that, well, how are you doing that? And I'm like, oh, we just play really well together. You yeah. know what I mean? Like our agencies work well together. Yeah. And, and it's the same leadership. workers, the same worker bees are on access task, healthy task. You know what I mean? We're yeah. constantly coming the same folks, usually taking on so many different um, committees because we all care about what yep. we're doing. So with today's podcast, um, we'll ask our partner agencies and we will as well. We will share out um, your programs, our treatment agencies, um, our recovery supports, all that kind of stuff. Is there anything else we want to make sure? Um, I, I think if there's any questions, we can, they can go on our website. It's uh, it's easy to find just to, in New Philadelphia City Health Department and um, just look for any questions they have. Just call I mean, if we miss you, we'll call you back. It's just because we have a couple of COVID things going on. <laughs> well, I wish you guys well. I appreciate yeah. the hard work y'all are doing. And uh, I know you do not have an easy job. So I appreciate oh, you. everything you're doing just to keep our residents and our community safe. So it's super important. So 
Thank you for sharing about the resources and the work you're doing and keep up the good work. Thank you. And Stay well. Uh, yeah. Stay well. Dance around the COVID. You Will can. do. Absolutely. <laughs> Listeners, thanks again for listening and uh, we'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tuscarawas County Anti-Drug Coalition podcast. Please follow us on Facebook and visit our website at adctusk.org.